Welcome to When Pigs Fly. We're uncovering Cincinnati's rich business history from the 1800s to today. We talk to companies from the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, what it takes to grow a successful business and to simply prost to future innovation. I'm one of your co-hosts, Patrick Bailey. And I'm your other co-host, Ellie Martin. And before we dive into today's conversation, (laughs) I want everyone to go download this episode. That means go up into the upper right hand corner, make sure you're following us and then download. Make sure you download all episodes. That helps us out tremendously. It helps people find us. It helps, you know, our ratings. It helps our visibility out there, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast, please do so. It helps us out immensely. And go check us out at When Pigs Fly. Dot fm to see all our previous episodes as well uh and our previous guests and on that note our previous guests have actually are help, helped us get a hold of today's mm. guests so come back capital and generator put together a studio program it was lightly mentioned in our episodes earlier and a studio program is where they build startups from scratch and lisa and forrest are part of that program where they created a startup called Barabill and Barabill helps customers find inaccuracies in their healthcare bills. I'm really <laughs> excited about this. Oh, this gets me excited too because at the end of the day, there is nothing transparent about our healthcare system. Nope. So, someone who is willing to dive into these numbers and into the intric- intricacies, gosh, that's intricacies. <laughs> <laughs> between insurance companies and the hospitals and those who are sending out the bills good for you guys so i'm i'm really excited to hear how they came about this idea and why they decided to dive into it so on that note let's bring them in. lisa forrest welcome to the when pigs fly podcast Um, To start out, let's uh, have you guys give a little bit about your background and how you guys, you know, met and the founding of Bearable. Well, first of all, thank you for having us. As for Forrest and I, like meeting and how did we meet? We, um, I've actually known Forrest since I first moved to Huntsville. So that like that was in 2002. So I've known him since I was seven. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we grew up together, Mm -hmm. Georgia, like elementary, middle and high school. And, you know, we drifted with, like, growing up and everything. And then Generator came along. So currently, I'm actually um, an internal Generator employee. So I'm an ideation and new ventures manager. And the main component of that job is to go through our studio cohort program as a co-founder. So technically, I'm the CEO of Verabil, and Forrest is my CTO. So is it just you two right now, then, managing mm-hmm. Verabil? Yep, it is just us. <laughs> what? It's so. Us. Explain, first of all, what Barabill is and where the inspiration to build Barabill came from. Yeah, so Barabill is a third-party company where we negotiate for lower medical bills on the behalf of clients. So any hospital patient that gets a bill, um, you know, coding, like coding bills are hard. Medical bills mm-hmm. are hard to understand, mm-hmm. which, by the way, is where our name com- came from. I um, I like puns a lot, so I was like, <laughs> and Forrest... For us also, like mascots and stuff too, we both do. So we're like, okay, a bear is cute. And also we take the complexities <laughs> of medical bills and we make it bearable. So, so that's where it came from. That's um, amazing. I love that you guys started with the mascot. It was also hard because normally when I do like naming stuff, I'm like, well, let's just think of a noun and then look up whatever that is in Latin. And that's the domain. But we were like looking at stuff where um, initially the name was deductible. And I was like, let's look up like the Latin name for goose. <laughs> and it was like answer, answer them, um, going through. And we were going through all these domains and all of them were taken. Uh, and eventually Lisa was like, Barabill? And I was like, I don't know, give it a shot. And it was available. I love that. So, okay, you guys are in a studio program, which means mm-hmm. you're creating the startup completely from scratch, which is what, two months into this whole program of making Barabill or mm-hmm. correct? Okay. Mm-hmm. So how did you come up with this idea and were there other ideas in the pipeline before you landed on this idea? So I feel like our ideation phase actually started a little bit before the program started because force and I had known each other from before. So we just kind of started talking about it a little bit. And I think, so I'm quite sure the idea came from like half an internal generator idea where we changed it a little bit and also half because Forrest, um, 
has previous experience in the entrepreneurial space, like in healthcare specifically. So it just made sense. And then, yeah, I was just like, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Um, because I have no experience whatsoever. So, <laughs> so, so how has that been though? Maneuvering the waters too, right? So Forrest, you have a little bit of experience, Lisa, you yeah. don't, but the healthcare system is so complicated. So yes. I have a, a degree in biomedical engineering. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I was uh, decided that I was going to start a, a startup in 2013 and kind of hit the ground running from there, working on that. Uh, and 2013 was also my freshman year in college. So it was, you know, really uh, kind of jumped into it. And so I had years of like talking with experts and everything else to kind of there. There's a lot of problems in our healthcare system. Mm-hmm. The uh, It's not so much difficult to define what that problem is, as long as you know what you're um, how to ask the question. Uh, the problem that we were facing was, well, where do we start and what benefits the, both of our strengths? And so since Lisa has this great psychology background, um, that kind of unearthed uh, a memory of mine where um, uh, health, uh, medical uh, billing and hospitals use something known as dark pattern design, which is uh, using design that instead of trying to encourage you to do something, it's encouraging you not to do something. And so knowing Lisa's background and in, in design and user experience and psychology, that's kind of prompted me to, to just bring that up to the conversation. And then we started going back and forth. I mean, we've ideated. So there have been so many iterations on this kind of idea. Uh, I don't know if anybody can take ownership of it at this point. But um, it, yeah. So when you say this dark pattern design, mm-hmm. and again, you there are so many issues as you were coming across in the healthcare system. What specifically was that pattern that you were seeing that you two wanted to improve on? Well, it's about the, okay. So eighty percent of medical bills have errors, mm-hmm. and if you find an error on uh, your medical bill and you go back to the hospital, you've got to make a phone call. You got to sit on waiting for 45 minutes. Oh, wow. After that, they're going to be like, hey, what's going on here, et cetera, et cetera. Like they're deliberately making it as long and difficult as possible and inconvenient as possible to uh, get information and to also advocate on your behalf. You know, this is the reason why if you go and uh, we're talking to one uh, medical bill negotiator who does it for private prisons. And he's like, yeah, my rate's $50,000 uh, to get started and then 25% of whatever I save. And it's, that sounds ridiculous until you know how much money is actually getting charged uh, uh, to people. So we've had uh, one uh, user, it was maybe 30 minutes of me going through and just comparing what they were charged versus like what the actual market rate should be. And it was $5,000 just there in, in medical bill errors. You know, the most explicit thing was they got charged for an ER visit that never happened. And we're finding that that's actually a trend among people who are giving birth in hospitals are getting charged for these ER visits. And based Mm -hmm. off of our uh, initial data that we have, we're having people say that that happened to uh, them or or seeing that in their bills as far back as four years from now. And it, and also, so are y'all familiar with what a venipuncture is? Mm -mm. So all that is, is sticking a needle in your arm. That's all, but on the medical bill, it says venipuncture. And it'll probably be hyphenated. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That sounds worse than it actually is what it is. (laughs) And so so you see that on your medical bill, and it might be hyphenated to say like V E N C. And then the only reason why we're able to know what that is is it has a CPT code associated with it Mm -hmm. that we can pull up from uh, from a database and look. But they were charging $26 per venipuncture. And so that's a that's a, you know that's one of those things where it's like the no, costs aren't necessarily an unexpected <laughs> things. It's in you know your bandages that should be three dollars or eighty, you know the venipuncture mm-hmm. which should be six dollars is twenty six. You know what, and and this is you know a much greater problem that we're going to be tackling. But at the end of the day, you're we're literally saving people thousands of dollars just by going through and saying, hey, this thing that you say happened didn't happen, and that's the first step. So this is where you're at today. Mm-hmm. What, I guess, what other iterations were there before you're like, hey, we're going to analyze line by line <laughs> people's medical bills because it's a huge problem, clearly, 80% you mentioned. What, like, where were you to where you are now? That's a good question. I feel like we never, like, we never really went down the route of like going through an ideation like 
and trying it out until we got to Bear Bill. So like with the other ideas, it was more like, oh, let's think about this. We'll do a little bit of research. Like initially I was thinking about, you know, the nursing shortage or the staff shortage because nurses mm-hmm. are treated so terribly. And like, I have a lot of good friends who are nurses and it's just awful how they're treated. And I mean, they don't get paid enough. They don't, they don't get enough sleep. They're treated terribly. It's short staffed all the time. So that was something I was interested in, but I think it it's such a complex issue and it's such a large system that we would have to tackle. I was like, well, maybe, maybe we'll get experience first in this. And then maybe the next startup can be that. <laughs> well, and plus we, we were limited to like what we could jump into. So it had to be something healthcare related and it had to be something software related. Mm-hmm. And we might have a hardware thing and there that, that software part wasn't super hard. Um, but one of the things is, is that in order for us to effectively define a problem that we're solving, you have to understand the user's story, like that customer experience. And so if we're building something for use in a hospital, we have to be in a hospital. We have to be able to observe people in a hospital. We have to be able to interview people who are in a hospital. Because a lot of the times people just get these problems and it's, you know, like a game of telephone. And by the time the engineer hears the problem, it's so warped and changed. But for us, you know, we start in with user and patient first. We couldn't do that uh, because at the beginning of this, we weren't allowed into a hospital or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And so one of the benefits of us going with Barabill or medical billing and stuff is that it was easy to get access to users to interview and talk to and understand what their problem is or if there is a problem. So it's also part of your strategy to collect I mean, I imagine to collect the data, to collect the numbers, because I think one of the biggest problems right now with healthcare is you can't go online and see how much it's going to be at a certain hospital for a knee replacement or a hip replacement. And it feels like we are never going to know that. But then it it also seems like something like you're doing over time, again, what you're doing is still very young, you're only two months in, could be very beneficial for folks down the line, because then you could start comparing numbers. Would you Mm -hmm. say that's correct? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that we definitely want to go down. And I mean, technically, it's actually like the law now for hospitals to provide how much their procedures cost. But (laughs) where? (laughs) Where? Tell me like where online? You can't go anywhere. It's nowhere online. And Forrest just had an experience. I'll let him talk about it. But I mean, it's just it's not funny. I shouldn't laugh. But it's just like it's so twisted that it's laughable for me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you've seen it. Yeah, and that's, you know, what we're, we're doing is, uh, in my mind, we're building an, an army. We're gearing up for a fight because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like there's, there's going to be, uh, well, yeah, yeah and there's, but there's going to be, um, you know, right now for patients to be able to advocate on their behalf effectively against the hospital does require, I'm glad you brought that up, like a class action lawsuit. Oh, wow. But we're making it so easy for people to have, to basically uh, uh, almost like uh, there's not a good word for it yet, but sort of like crowdsourcing or bringing together all these people with all these different separate experiences that normally wouldn't be able to negotiate and advocate for themselves on their behalf. Because when you're, when you go to a hospital and you're, you're trying to advocate for yourself, it's you against the big hospital. Yeah. But with us, it's, we're bringing all of these different people together uh, and we're able to represent and, and we're and, some point in the future we'll be able to have more and more of a negotiating position against the hospital but yeah uh, collecting data so uh, this is another example of dark pattern design uh, the law passed under the biden administration requiring the hospitals to list their most common procedures in their ref- uh, uh, respective pricing on their website but if you go on to their any any hospital you can think of go onto the website and it's hidden Or you go on and you type into the calculator and it's really hard for you. All they're doing is they're creating something known as sludge, which is just slowing you down and making it more of a pain to just get a basic answer, which is how much does this cost? And we are going to, uh, with our, we'll call it Bear Bill Plus, uh, a subscription, allow people for $4.99. You know, it's like I have a procedure or I have... Uh, um, you know, something going on, or, or basically we can predict your future healthcare costs based off of the data and all that you give us, and then give you a path of like, this is where you can go, this is the provider, this is how much it's going to be. You're like the and skip lagged of healthcare, like we're, we're, we're a travel, yeah, the travel agent that's going to give you the best deal. We're a pirate's map. We say X marks the spot right there, but this is how you travel to it, because it is, it's very... 
but yeah, so an example of why it is that, so I don't know if y'all know this or not, but um, depending on the insurance and the hospital that you're at, you might actually be paying much more than if you didn't have any insurance at all. And so the uh, reason why that is, is because we have to think about it in terms of a, a, of a black box, which is you have the insurer and you have the hospital. Uh, and so the insurer is like Blue Cross of Blue Shield of Alabama talking to UAB. So that's one instance right there. And so they go in and they negotiate and the negotiator from the insurance or insurance provider uh, has like, you know, we need to get to this number. You know, at the end of the day, when all these items and all add up or based off of our group or whatever, it doesn't matter. But you have these negotiators going in where it's not about uh, what is the fair market rate for this procedure. It's about it's, it's a football game. It's going in and trying to get it best. So uh, what mm. happens there is that for the same procedure, same doctor, same hospital, same everything. And all that is the difference is an insurance plan. Um to give you an example, a artificial heart on one insurance plan, the same hospital and everything like that, is $165,000 on one plan and $45 on another. And it's like, how? Is that real? Yeah. No, that's real. I can, I can show you the, that's crazy. the documentation. <laughs> that is <Yeah>. absolutely crazy. <laughs> Elaborate on that a little bit more if you don't mind, because it's just like yeah. how and why well, has it become of, so skewed this way? If we go back to the 80s, uh, we can look at uh, a fundamental change in business philosophy, which was mm-hmm. uh, basically the, the business school's uh, before the 80, uh, but let's just say 1980. And, you know, don't fact check me on the date. It's around 1980s <laughs> when this is happening. But uh, it used to be that the purpose of a business was to deliver value to the consumer. And around 1980, uh, uh, somebody came out and said, hypothetic, new hypothesis. What if instead of that, the purpose of a business was to maximize profit? Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so what happens is, is that if you have a CEO and their new measurement of success, you know, if you're CEO of company, you want to be successful, you want to be seen as successful. The measurement of success became you need to be uh, more profitable Mm -hmm. the next quarter than this quarter. All right. We are now, what, 40 years later. How many times can you know what you can't at some point you can't be making innovations in the business model in order to be meeting that goal. At some point you do start to plateau. And the only way that you can continue making uh, more profit the next quarter than the previous one is if you start doing things that we would consider unethical, which is, you know, uh, uh, cutting costs on uh, employees or or raising the amount of money for it. Uh, And then at the same overcharging. Uh, And then at the same time you have people who are, you know, you have, people who are good actors in a bad system and you have bad actors in a bad system. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, we can't sit here today and go through and, the and numbers measure don't everything lie, though, either. So that's, yeah. that's where you guys full circle. Yeah. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but at the end of the day, it, they're businesses, right? They're not nonprofits. You guys aren't a nonprofit either. You guys are going to be making money off of this, which we will be mm-hmm. going down that, how you guys will be planning to make money off of this. So do you think there could still be a let's make money and still have a good ethical outcome? Well, I think that's the, the, the a little bit of a logical fallacy that we've been taught and raised on, which is um, just because you're not doing profit at all costs doesn't mean that you can't be profitable. You can be a profitable business and not be trying to squeeze blood from a stone. You know, what we are not, what we're suggesting here is not a radical suggestion. And yet we're told it is, and, you know, and the reason, you know, there is a clear incentive for there to be a narrative that it has to be all or nothing. Lisa, what are your thoughts on, you know, I guess the two, do you think they can live in a world together? Yeah, I mean, I think realistically, and this is a little bit of like a rant, but I feel like (laughs) the height of like emotional intelligence is understanding that 
your entire life in the world is a whole ass gray area. Like nothing is ever actually black and white. Rarely ever. I mean, maybe sometimes here and there, but rarely ever. And I think this absolutely falls into that. And like you said, like Bearville is going to make money, you know, like we do need revenue to continue helping people, Mm -hmm. but our core value and mission is, you know, set in the fact that we want to save people time and money. And if we don't do that, then we're doing something wrong. So speaking of money now, here's the question. I know you guys are only two months into this thing, but how do you, how do you guys plan on making money? Are you going to do similar to what you guys, uh, Forrest, you mentioned earlier, that consultant that does it for the prisons, you know, mm-hmm. 50 K and then like 25% on top. Like what is, how are you planning on uh, making money yourselves? So currently because Forrest and I both have had like personal experiences with medical bills, like, I mean, almost cleaning our families dry. Um, mm. We are very set on taking 15% of your savings if we save you anything. And if we don't save you anything, then fine. So be it. At least you know that we did everything we could. And hey, maybe you can refer us. So that's that's it. <laughs> so you're yeah. going to obviously test that out. Um, I guess are you guys measuring any other metrics to make sure that you guys are having, I guess, that ethical and, mm-hmm. you know, impact side of your business uh, measured Mm -hmm. consistently? So yes, we are measuring like on average how much we save people. We're doing stuff like that. But right now we're still so new and we're still like, we don't have enough clients, I feel like, to give you like a good number. Maybe that's just me. But also like, I just know from personal experience with Forrest and me, like we work a lot. We're on the phone for hours per week, like talking to hospitals. So if anything, like, and we're, we're told this a lot that we could probably charge more, but again, like that's not, yes, of course we want to make money, but also we want to help you too. You know, progress isn't earned. Progress is maintained. So the secret to us being an ethical company is not by us sitting down, writing on a piece of paper and saying, all right, we're going to be ethical. And this is how it is a daily convert. Like you have to wake up every day and say, are we doing this right? And be able to, you know, and just get used to being able to take that look at yourself in the mirror. Because the second you start saying like, okay, we did the good thing and now we're moving on to, to something else. It, it allows, there, there's a degradation of that over time. So any kind of a system or any kind of ethics or anything, that's, that's, that's a daily conversation. That's not something that you just do and then you're done. So I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, but talk about when you're working with these clients, paint a picture as to what that conversation looks like and sounds like thus far. Boris, do you want to take this or do you yeah, want to? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so talk us through the process. Right now, it's you send us your uh, uh, bill or your documents uh, either via like a text or an email or whatever that is. Uh, that, you know, we're, we're actually still uh, uh, defining all the different channels. I'm actually looking at making it to where you could do it through Facebook Messenger, even uh, and stuff like that. But basically making it as easy as possible for people to send us their information, their data uh, uh, through whatever means that is best comfortable or whatever way it's sent to them. Like, for example, if you can only get it via the mail. So we get that and we use uh, uh, computer vision to automatically pull all the data uh, and information, relevant data and information from that, and then compare it against the database of uh, pricing. And also just to uh, say, okay, what does this look like in this area, this zip code, like on average, like how much does that cost? Uh, And then what we do is we uh, go through it and have a conversation with the customer and say, hey, uh, you know, we know you had X, Y, and Z. Can you tell us, you know, for example, if we notice that they went to an ER visit, It's as simple as sending a message or something like that. Like, did you actually go to the ER uh, when you were delivering your child? Uh, Yes or no. And so you're asking these yes or no questions based off of uh, the bill that you receive. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you're also comparing it against pricing. And then you're able to get two things, which is uh, one, uh, were there any errors on the medical bill? And two, were there any overcharges on the medical bill? Because what can happen is something known as upcoding, which is... Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, like for the ER visit, uh, those uh, visits are rated from a level of one to five, and that determines how much you're getting charged. Mm. A level five ER visit is a lot more expensive than a level one. And so uh, one of the things that we'll be implementing in the future is uh, syncing with your medical records and then automatically seeing like, 
because it you know you the hospital can be wrong on the medical bill uh insurance provider can be wrong on the explanation of benefits uh although we haven't found any uh, evidence of that yet um but the actual medical records that the hosp- uh that the doctor is keeping track of that is not wrong that is the mm-hmm. gold standard and if they're lying on that we have a much bigger conversation uh, uh ahead of <laughs> that's us that's when you pr- bring out the lawyers right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, so, uh, that's going to be really exciting because what that allows us to do is actually go through and, uh, completely automate the experience of viewing all of these different, uh, uh, versions where you have the medical records you're looking at, you're looking at the medical bill, you're looking at the insurance explanation of benefits all at once. And with those three documents, we can automatically identify any kind of issues that, uh, might be happening. So I guess my next question is, is this all manual or are you guys using like artificial intelligence or, you know, some kind of There's wonky of computer software? Yeah. yeah, it's a lot for one person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Patrick, we all have to start somewhere. Okay. <laughs> and so, so to start, like, yes, I give Forrest a lot of props because this poor man was like entering data manually from like a random medical bill and just entering into Excel and then just comparing one by one down each line. And I was like, I would simply just move countries. Like I would just leave. <laughs> <laughs> like so much props. So we were doing it manually, but because Force is CTO and has that knowledge with like AI and machine learning, he's been able to automate a lot of stuff. So on our end of things, it is a little quicker and it, you know, our lead time is a little bit shorter, but at the same time, regardless of how quick we are, hospitals and their billing departments or, you know, their providers or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, whenever we send an official audit or a coding review, it usually will take between three to four weeks. And the most recent one I've gotten is 45 business days. (laughs) So how are you guys going to deal with that? Just like like the time. I'm so excited to talk about this because I'm going to nerd out about it. Go for Um, it. (laughs) We're going to automate it all. So what we're doing is we're going through these experiences manually. We're sitting on the phone call or we're, we're sending the mail. We're doing all that kind of stuff manually. But what we're doing is we're once again, we're creating a map. And so we're mapping out all the different ways that they make this a pain in the ass. Am I allowed to curse? Yes. I should have asked beforehand. <laughs> so we're mapping out all the different ways that they make it a pain in the ass to deal with, you know, this, you know, when this insurance plan deals with this hospital and all that kind of stuff. And we create this map once and then i can go back and i can automate uh not only you know pulling in the data and knowing what it is to to have but also automate the phone calls so instead of having to have us sit on the phone we Mm -hmm. can have an ai sit on the phone and Mm -hmm. ask the questions because they the medical billing departments uh are are pretty strict in terms of like what they say and what they don't but it's also the terms that they use and all are very specific. They, they're taught to talk like robots. So it makes it easy for us to train a robot to talk back to them. Uh, and they won't really know uh, the difference. So if you've ever listened to or watched the video of the Google AI making a phone call to the hair salon, mm-hmm. we can do that now today. Oh. That's that's no. not all restricted or anything. Yeah. So it's super realistic, and and the AI voice won't cry on the line. Like if you're mean <laughs> enough to me, and by that I mean if you tell me no, I will immediately cry. So yeah, <laughs> way more efficient. That's true. That's true. But if we need it to cry in order to get sympathy from the person on the line, happen. we we can use the the data. Uh, but yeah, so you know we're recording uh, our conversations yeah. and and mapping it all out. Uh, you know, we're just at the very beginning stage, but I've already got uh, the AI trained for like pulling in documentation. So if you have mm-hmm. to take a picture of something with your phone, we've already got that part automated. Uh, you know, so and there's also APIs available that we can access mm-hmm. from insurance providers. I don't know yet if from hospital. Uh, what I anticipate being the hardest uh, uh, portion of this is dealing with the hospital. Uh, and it's going to be on a case by case basis. There, there's not going to be a situation where it's going to be like, all hospitals are bad or, or mm. anything like that. It, it's going to be, some are going to be a pain and some are not. But I guess like, I guess flip side of that, is there such a new situation and scenario where the hospitals want to work with you guys to yeah. increase, you know, customer service or, uh, you know, customer reviews? Because to me, I know a lot of hospital systems are like, how can we just make this more bearable part of the plan, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Absolutely. for our customers? Absolutely. So, and that's really the big thing is right now, 
uh, if you if you talk to a hospital administrator or somebody, they're saying the reason why we're having to charge this much is because when we go and talk to the insurance, they don't pay they don't pay the hundred and fifty six thousand mm-hmm. dollars. They pay only twenty five thousand dollars. Blah blah blah. And it's because of these black uh, box negotiations that uh, I, I talked about earlier on, which is, um, you know, they're in this state where there is no uh, 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 re- how universal health care works is normally uh, you have the hospital, you have the uh, medical device provider, uh, a manufacturer, and they all negotiate with only one person. And so that's how you're able to get consistency of prices. So for us, the future is really us becoming that single party negotiator between the insurance provider and the hospital, because we're able to go in and say, hey, when uh, uh, your patient comes in and receives this procedure, you need to get reimbursed this much. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure you get reimbursed that much from the provider and you don't have to deal with the negotiations and everything like that. Because what's fascinating is we're all just in a sea of, of it's, it's like fractal negotiation bureaucracy. You know, you, you, you have the patient, they have to deal with it. You have the doctor, they have to deal with it. You have the insurance provider, they have to deal with it. It's all different connected. And because everybody has their own system and how to do it, there's no easy way to just plug in and, and go. But if we map everything out, we have this all figured out, and we are able to, um, it's also a, a, a matter of trust and authenticity. But if I go to a hospital and I say, if you use our system, you won't have any more medical billing errors uh, and you're going to get reimbursed for 100 percent of whatever it is that you say, because the insurance provider trusts us and knows that we're really good at making sure that no errors occur. You know, if we can ensure 100 percent that there are going to be no errors, um, that's exciting because that could potentially mean that these problems that we're having with not knowing what's going on, going in and everything uh, can be solved almost overnight just through an implementation of our system. But in order for us to get there, we have to first fight and struggle and, and go through it all. So what's the relationship between you guys and the insurance companies? Like, can you help, you know, dive into that relationship? Because right now what I'm imagining is you have basically really three big relationships that you guys interact with and you're trying to make them all work, right? You have the Mm -hmm. patient, you have the hospital or healthcare system, and then you have the insurance company. And then you guys, the fourth, you know, corner of that little box, if you're going to. So how, how do you guys work with insurance companies? I, I think it really depends on the insurance company and, I mean, it's funny that you ask that because it's like for one client I was calling, I called the, like the hospital's medical billing department. And I said, why is this shown up on here? Something, something about insurance, et cetera. And they're like, oh, that's something that you need to discuss with the insurance. And I was like, bet I'll do that. So I call the insurance company and they're like, yeah, actually, no, I have no clue what you're talking about. That's definitely a medical billing thing. And I'm like, okay, well, I- I have one more try before I start crying. <laughs> so, so I called that to the medical billing. And I think like, I think something that's that we like that force and I are reminded of when we call these people is that these are literally just people doing their jobs. And mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. they're still humans on the other end. Right, right. And for the most part, like people who are probably calling hospital billing departments, because they're so frustrated at that point, and they don't know what's going on, understand, understandably, so like, they're frustrated and probably not the kindest to them. So it's just mm-hmm. like, we're just trying to, like you said, Patrick, like balance it out. But with our, our relationships with insurance companies, I feel like it's, a little bit better and it makes more sense than a relationship with the hospital, if that makes sense. I don't know. Forrest, maybe you can. Well, yeah, because for the insurance companies, we're making sure that they're not paying for stuff that didn't happen. It's simple as that. That saves uh, the insurance companies uh, money. And it, it, yeah. So I, this, this might be a little out of left field um, because you guys are, are trying to dispute errors, but I can't mm-hmm. stop thinking about force that idea that you were talking about. Well, if you're having open heart surgery or whatever, a heart transplant, you know, someone could be paying $165,000 and someone could be paying $45. But where you guys come in, that's not necessarily your job. If someone is getting screwed over and paying $165,000, are you finding that that has to do a lot with like, the complexity of somebody's plans and everything else, or typically are there typically is, is are there errors throughout a bill like that? Or is it just so, like, well, 
this is your plan and t- there aren't any errors and you signed on the dotted line here. This, this is where my extensive background in listening to podcasts really shines. Because uh, there are a lot of healthcare podcasts and all that go into this. And if you talk to insurance experts, they can't figure out what is the best plan for themselves. Nobody knows when they're buying an insurance plan, whether or not it's going to do everything that, it's, that, they, mm-hmm. that they think it's going to do. They just hope. Because it's also the explanation on the insurance plans is never going to be. So, for example, for that hospital uh, uh, that had the, the uh, artificial heart, if you were to look, so they, they give you, a, it's almost a gigabyte size file uh, that you download from their website. And it has 1.7 million different items on it that are, are covered. So if you're like, I want to make sure that I have uh, uh, insurance coverage that covers me for, you know, a general thing such as, I don't know, diabetes. That might be the case, but then if you go into the super itemized list and depending on the medication that you're prescribed and all that kind of stuff, you can fall into uh, essentially a trap hole that, yeah. that uh, you had no way of knowing was, was there uh, and that, you know, without something kind of with us, uh, without a but system like us, you wouldn't be able to know. Just, but you're not disputing anything like that if, if someone... Well, had... not I... yet. Once I think we it hit a critical because, mass. Yeah. And also, like, if there is an overcharge, like, nothing is stopping me from going, hey, by the way, um, according to this website or whatever, the, like, average for this procedure in your state or even in the city is this much, but you charge them mm-hmm. this much. Is there any way we can lower that down? So, yeah, we're going to try it. But the chances of them saying, uh, sure, we'll lower the medical bill <laughs> are is, you know, quite low compared to if we have an error and we're like, yeah, no, this actually didn't happen. Then they for sure have to change it. If that makes sense. Yeah. I guess I would love to dive a little bit into, you know, are there any regulations that you guys have to deal with? You know, legal wise, like you guys are dealing with money. You guys are dealing with healthcare. You're dealing with Mm -hmm. insurance. Just, uh, I'm just thinking regulation central. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're, we're making sure that we're HIPAA compliant on our platform and everything uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, everybody's data is protected uh, when it comes to negotiating on patients behalf and everything like that. I'm sure that there's going to be uh, greater regulations that we're going to need to implement. But this is really a situation where and in, this is a thing in most healthcare situations or any kind of healthcare startup, which is uh, regulations can be used as a as a cudgel. Uh, Mm -hmm. to prevent new competition from entering the market. Uh, And I know that personally from my background. I'm currently in a a, a law, uh, a court case with the Alabama State Board of Prosthetists and Orthotists because they're not happy that I was making uh, knee braces. And I said, well, no, my knee braces are no different. They're just a better version of what you would get at a Walgreens, but they're accusing me of being an orthotist. And, you know, an orthotist charges four thousand dollars for a knee brace. We charge two hundred and fifty. You know, so it, you know there are antitrust uh, uh, concerns, but that shouldn't. It's important that we follow regulation to make sure that we properly represent uh, uh, the consumer and that we are ethical in everything that we do. Mm. But the regulations that I am most cognizant of us having to deal with are going to be the ones created to prevent new competition or anything from entering the space. And for that, I'm a lot more hard headed. (laughs) So I guess now my next question is, are you hoping to do more of like a subscription model? Like someone pays for this, you know, continuously, especially if like they maybe have regular doctor's visits or hospital visits Mm -hmm. um, depending on their time in their life or, you know, especially for younger people uh, who do not probably go to the doctor as much as they probably should or the hospital as much as they should, you know, Mm -hmm. are you doing like one-off pricing as well? Yeah. So, I mean, because we're so new, we're still like looking at like possibly like, you know, different revenue or business models, but Mm -hmm. right now we're pretty set on just, you know, 15, 15% 15% of your savings. If we don't save you anything, then so be it. But our end goal is to become like this AI app for people mm-hmm. to where we do monitor your, your health insurance. And we do say, Hey, this procedure is, is this much at this hospital and this much at that hospital. So we want to offer more of a service later down the line. And when that does happen, I think we will end up definitely doing a subscription model. Kind of like true bill. 
You know, you have mm -hmm. the the free version of it, and then you have a paid version of it that gives you greater features and functionality. Yeah, I kind of think of it as like or Truebill or like Mint. You know, with all your finances, yeah. you right. it, it buckets everything and it it breaks it down according to where so, you're spending, et cetera, et cetera. So then, are you guys more mm -hmm. of like a fintech company than uh, a healthcare company? I think. I think we're we're a bit of both. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Which is yeah, it's funny because I have, I feel like those are the two fields that I have the least amount of experience <laughs> in. <laughs> so how has that been then for you, maneuvering this this territory as as you know a young entrepreneur? Um, I think it's it's been really interesting. Part of it because I'm lucky enough to be internally part of Generator, so I have that stability. Mm -hmm. So. I have so much respect for like Boris and our other cohort members because these folks like quit their jobs to like go through this program and go completely all in without the stability of like having a salary like I do. So like so much respect for them. I don't know how they do it. Um, but I just, it's, it's definitely been a learning experience. And for me, I think there's a bit of imposter sy syndrome there, but there's also mm -hmm. like, because I don't know what I don't know, I think anything is possible. I'm like, yeah, I don't really know what it's usually like, so I'm just going to try it anyway, regardless of whether it's yeah. usually not possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you bring a different mindset and a different perspective yeah. into the arena. Right. And there's, a, there's historical precedent for people who are not industry ex experts being the ones to bring change. Uh, a classic example is the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. The Wright brothers were uh, bicycle mechanics, and they were the first to fly uh despite there was a, i forget the guy's name oh my gosh i was gonna say but basically they, were they, were, weren't they actually not the first yeah they were the first don't uh, no. don't say that with ohioans yeah. lisa you just came to, <laughs> to ohio you do not say that to ohioans oh this is great right pat and dayton <laughs> i need to I'm, leave I'm good i didn't even realize i was leaning into it uh so yeah so they were the first to fly despite the fact that there was a, another group that was funded completely. They had all the money in the world. They had the greatest experts in the world. And it's the difference between explicit and implicit uh, uh, motivation. It, it's the fact that we're doing this because we believe in it. We want to solve a problem. Uh, it, it's, it's not for the fame. It's not for the money. It's because it's important. It's because it's right. Uh, and that, you know, for me, if we were to look at the his historical precedent, I think we have a much greater chance just based off of that. Mm. Uh, but I'm also, you know, a biomedical engineer. I have a lot of experience in this kind of stuff. And yeah. uh, at the end of the day, what we're solving is uh, uh, essentially just making a really nice user interface for an Excel sheet that is automatically finding these, these different things. Yeah, I don't know if y'all can tell, but Forrest and I balance each other out in almost every aspect where he's like really yeah. optimistic and I'm like, no, we're done. We're done. <laughs> <I can't> be <laughs> so Lisa, then what? Okay, so from your experience thus far and being so new to this journey, what would you tell someone who might be considering a similar path like you? Well, I think a really efficient and smart way to do it is to find like accelerators like generator or, you know, TechStars or any other company like that, because I mean, they offer you, well, one, it's like they, they invest in you. I mean, there's an equity trade, but I think it's worth it. And then they let you, they kind of walk you through this entire program of like teaching you how to make your pitch deck, executive summary, et cetera, et cetera. So I think going through a program would really benefit people, but if they want to bootstrap it, like power to you, that's freaking awesome. Like I, I cry so much, you guys. I don't know if y'all can <laughs> tell, but like, I, like, there's just no way. Like, I, I just have so much respect. So, I, I would say go for it because, like, five years from now is still going to be five years from now, whether you go for it now or whether you go for it then. Mm. So, regardless, like, you know, we're young. We all die. Just, yeah. <laughs> A little pessimistic, but I like it. I no, like I, it. I, I like it. It's, it's being realistic. It's so, real. My my last question then is, um, what is the one thing that you want people to know about Bear Bill? I think I want people to know. Well, for me, I'll let Forrest say, you know, who should feel after. But I I think that like Bear Bill came from like this hope that we just want to help people, especially because it comes from personal experiences. So 
although we may not be deep industry experts in like medical billing or coding or insurance or anything like that, we are absolutely experts from our previous experiences of dealing with like, you know, family traumas, family tragedies, and like, Mm -hmm. you know, dealing with the medical bills because of that. And so when I am on these Mm -hmm. phone calls, like, (laughs) I'm teetering on the edge of bawling or not. Uh um, (laughs) I'm like, well, you know, when I was 12, and my mom had a lot of medical bills that she had to deal with for my dad, like, it would have been so nice to have that. So that that thought kind of keeps me like, I don't know, I guess, stable. (laughs) You're kind of their partner along this journey to financial, I guess, freedom from medical bills. Right. Yeah. What about you, Forrest? Uh, When I was uh, first got started, um, I had raised only $25,000. And I spent pretty much most of that on getting the equipment and everything set up for my first startup, which means I didn't know how I was going to pay rent. I didn't know how I was going to pay I didn't know how I was going to f- uh, feed myself the next day. So it was this state of chronic stress going mm. from day to day. And eventually it became two days. I, you know, two days from now, I, I didn't know how much, how I was going to eat three days from now. I didn't know how I was going to eat. And eventually that became months and, and so forth and so on. Uh, but what happened during that is I got really good at asking myself the question of why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? is you know and the answer was um the reason why they call it values is because you're willing to pay a price uh mm-hmm. and i have a very strong value a sense of value and i believe Barabill has a very sense a very strong sense of these values of a belief in the right to affordable medical care a belief in the right to uh live your life as healthy as we can manage you to be because uh, health will, uh, it, it is the defining factor in not only your, your physical health, but, you know, a, a bad bill will bankrupt you. It's the number one cause of bankruptcy in America. You know, we're talking about something that is fundamental to the human experience, that if we can solve this, if we can make sure that people are able to just live their lives, the quality of life and not only our society is exponentially you can't imagine how much better it will be because it's just so large uh so for me bearer bill is a belief in uh a, a, a affordable health care uh and and the right to to be healthy you know not not even just to to be perfect but just to have a, a fighting chance Yeah. So what Forrest is really saying is he's trying to help society so we can get to flying cars. I get it. (laughs) (laughs) Means to an end. (laughs) Well, before we get to flying cars, let's talk flying pigs. Lisa, you are new to the Cincinnati ecosystem Mm -hmm. and especially new to the, you know, the startup scene here. What is one thing that you've learned about, I guess, our community um, if any, and what do you think we could be, could be doing better? So I, I'm very new to the startup scene in general. Um, so I didn't really know that there was such a close like atmosphere about mm. it. Like I had no clue. And then I moved to Cincy and I was like, wow, like everyone is actually really nice. And like, once you're in that, that startup environment, like I just had this idea in my mind that everything was going to be really competitive, but I feel like people are a lot more willing to help rather than trying to compete with you. So even Mm if, you know, we're kind of direct competitors, so like, hey, I'll introduce you to someone that might be a better fit or something like that. So I think that's really cool. As for what, like, y'all could do better, I... I've only been here for two months. I don't know. It is pretty cold, though. So if some, someone could change the climate, you know, make it you a did, little warm. You did come right before winter, so. <laughs> yeah. It is my fault, but. <laughs> Y'all but no, need I, a I seasonal here. depression starter kit that every yeah. new citizen receives. It's called only from wine. people from the South. <laughs> uh, we'll send you a really good boxed wine. We have them all. Oh, good. Perfect. That was a Cincinnati, another Cincinnati startup that was on the podcast. So. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you so much. This was a really great conversation. I've learned a lot. 
and I'm sure Allie did too. And True. So. I'm 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 an advocate, so I lo- I Aww. love to hear what you guys are doing, and uh, I really truly wish you the best of luck moving forward. I'm very Thank excited y'all. about where y'all are gonna go. <laughs> Did you say Barry? Was that Barry? Bearable. On that note. Thanks, guys. <laughs> On that note. See ya. <laughs> no, thank, y'all, thank y'all so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was a very exciting oh my conversation. Oh gosh, no. <laughs> we just <laughs> left this conversation. I, I, I just love the pun. Bearable? I oh, it, bearable? Re- honestly, from a branding perspective, it's good. It's, it's good. really good. And I think this team is going to absolutely crush it. I mm-hmm. know this might be me jumping in the gun because they're only two months into existence. Oh. But, you know, Forrest and Lisa complement each other greatly yeah uh, you know they each bring a little different i guess energy to to the room but they also mm-hmm. bring their own experiences and knowledge uh, mm-hmm. both of them mentioned you know personal experiences with dealing with the healthcare system and healthcare charges but also you know lisa comes from a psychology background so she can talk yeah. like think about more like the mental aspect people are in these uh conversations and then forrest you know comes from a biomedical engineering background so he's more physical and you know uh thinking about you know the tang- tangible things that people mm-hmm. are dealing with in these situations um and then i think ultimately the reason why they're going to go far is they have the values you know a set out and they know where they want to go and they know what they want to solve yeah the the moral foundation and their ethical pursuit uh i right off the bat i give them credit for even attempting mm. to try to enter the the territory of healthcare because it's extremely complicated as we said during our conversation and where do you even begin so it, it's great as as you just mentioned that they're bringing two really great backgrounds and for Lisa specifically, I liked when she talked about the fact that she isn't the most knowledgeable when it comes to the healthcare mm. system. But I, I personally love that because of the example of the Wright brothers. You know, you're bringing in a new perspective uh, into the field that, you know, maybe someone else who's in it hasn't really thought about because you're so deep into mm-hmm. it. You could train yourself to, to think a certain way. And she is able to step back and see all these pieces on a larger, greater scale. And that's then what rolls into, which I thought was so interesting that Forrest was talking about the dark pattern design, mm. you know, looking at the, the, the greater scale and seeing how these, how this industry is really pigeonholing people into unfortunate situa- situations where there are a lot of financial errors. And this is putting people in thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of debt and going into bankruptcy, bankruptcy which changes people's lives. And they're exposing and they're trying to expose that. 80% of medical bills yep. have some kind of error or that's, over overpriced, which is yep. like blows my mind. That's that's a lot. And Think so, about it. I'm sure you've probably experienced it yourself. I probably have, but you know, I'm mm-hmm. definitely one of those people that probably just paid. <laughs> but, but, but that's the other that's the other exactly. side of the coin, but right? If I Either had you, a, you try to fight it mm-hmm. and which becomes a whole again, you're sitting on, on the phone for an hour, forty five minutes, two hours, next thing you know, are you even sure that they're gonna be able to have that want to have that dialogue with you to maybe maybe mm-hmm. fix it or you just pay it because Yeah. It's I easy think, and it's convenient. You know, if assuming I assuming you have the finances. If I had bearer bill available, I think I would just upload, you know, my uh, you know, receipt and hopefully we can get you know, get the issue resolved. Yeah, uh, well speaking well, speaking of that, right, we we didn't have a chance to we did not record this, but uh po- post recording, one of the hiccups that Forrest and Lisa have come across is the fact Mm. that great they have a wait list of 50 plus clients who are looking to participate in bear bill but when it's time for them to participate they're coming into they're coming across an issue where people are not uploading their bills Mm. and they're not submitting them so if you are listening to this they have a feedback button if you maybe by chance have participated in this why aren't you and or if you're listening, what do you think you're what what is your thought behind that? Why do you think people are not uploading their bills? And if you have any ideas on solutions and you just yeah. want to get help 
a burgeoning startup here in Cincinnati, please feel free to go to bearbill.com and reach out to them. They actually have a feedback button. They also have a place where you can sign up for the wait list. So if you have bills that you want to, you know, have fixed and become more bearable, (laughs) (laughs) I love this, Uh, (laughs) you know, go to their website, upload your bill and, you know, give it a shot. I think right now they are obviously still trying to figure things out. Yeah. But, you know, if you're an early adopter uh, like myself and Ali, you know, go out there, try things out. Uh, worst situ- case situation, you might save a few bucks. So, uh, you know, go check that out. And speaking of checking out their website, make sure you check out our website and, you know, download our latest podcast give us a review hopefully five stars uh and you know feel free to reach out to us at hosts at when pigs fly.fn that is hosts at when pigs fly.fn yeah speaking of feedback we love your feedback and if you really like this podcast don't forget to tell a friend or a family member or a step cousin doesn't really matter tell somebody about it we appreciate you (laughs) and on that note ali i think it's time to cheers cheers And here's some necessary legal stuff. Ali Martin and Patrick Bailey developed the When Pigs Fly podcast in collaboration with the Up Company LLC. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or any financial interest in the companies which appear on the show unless otherwise indicated. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of the EW Scripts Company and its affiliates or Generator Management LLC and its affiliates or any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment or legal advice on the show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week. We also want to give a shout out to Claire and Christian of Moonbow. They're the two artists of our intro song, which is so catchy and get stuck in our heads all the time. So bop over to Spotify or wherever you find your music and give them a listen. And Like the Night by Moonbow is courtesy of Silver Lake Sync.